It was the 1830s. Land was cheap in Michigan. Marshes and trees covered plots that were sold for dollars, luring farmers to come in and clear the land. We became a state in 1837, and they had already been pushing really hard to get people to move into the state because there was a population requirement that we had to meet before we could become a state. And so the best way to do that is to make the land very cheap and encourage people to come in and uh, you know, improve the property and uh, bring family members in and the population grows. And so there were a number of settlers that came in uh, to purchase the land and to um, have their farms. Of course, once they got here, they had to clear all the trees because we were a forest. So that's one reason why it was cheap. You know, get them in here, build up the area, and create a community. 30 minutes east of Lansing, Sanford Marsh and his wife purchased the lot in 1833. They were the first white settlers to the area buying land located on the northwest corner of Okemos and Mount Hope Road. Behind them came Freeman and Caroline Bray. The first realtors, they sold off the southeast corner of their land, this section becoming the site of a village that would take first the name Samford, then Hamilton, and eventually Okemos. For most of the early settlers, farming was their way of life. Well, my great-great-grandfather was Johann Georg uh, Grettenberger, that's John George Grettenberger in, uh, in, in English. And uh, he came here from Germany in about 1845. Uh, he learned about some school land, they called it, available at very reasonable prices up in the Lansing area. And he and his son, Jake, the oldest son, came up here by foot from Ann Arbor and arranged to buy 80 acres at $4 an acre, I might say, uh, and a homestead here on the Meridian Township. There were some people living right here in the Okemos area uh, that came uh, at that early stage, long before it, there was much to do about anything in, in this part of Michigan. As time went on, industry arose in Okemos. The village was located at a crossroads, as well as a good section of waterland, making it a choice place for mills to grow out of. So the, the way the river was set up, it was that nice horseshoe kind of hook um, in Okemos. And what happened was uh, they built a dam. And then uh, the mill race then spilled over and you could build sawmills there. And we had at least two sawmills. In 1842, Bray and his brother-in-law, Joseph Kilborn, built a dam across the Red Cedar River and established a water-powered sawmill, the first industry in Okemos. Then in 1854, Colonel E. Walker bought the water rights and built a steam grist and sawmill. Today, the site is located in what is now known as Ferguson Park. The year 1852 saw the state of Michigan charter a company to improve the road. And so, the plank road was begun. Prior to the relocation of the capital, if you wanted to get from Okemos or Lansing area down to Detroit, I, it was really rough going. In 1847, all of those legislators and their staff suddenly had to move up from Detroit to the little, little village of, of Lansing, and they left their families. So whenever they wanted to go back home and visit their family, as I say, it could take three to six days one way. So finally, after the legislature had been here a year or so, they, they said, no, we've got to improve the roads. You went from a three to six day journey down to a 10 to 12 hour journey. Two inch thick oak planks were laid on the road surface, spanning from the old capital to the new with multiple tow houses in between. When the plank road was first opened, you'd have people leave their house and business to run outside and watch the stagecoaches raced down the roads because it was so fast. And so in order to pay for it, and also to pay for the repairs that were constantly needed, you had a system of toll gates that you had to stop along the way and pay. And the second toll gate on the road from Lansing to Howell was located along Grand River Avenue um, on the south side of Park Lake Road. Toll gate keepers collected one cent per mile per horse. The trip from Detroit to Lansing costing on average $3 in fare. The plank road was finished in 1860. 
and in 1881, the oak planks were replaced with gravel. And the population of the village grew, changing the land and lives of the Native Americans who lived there. Their leader was Chief John Okemos. Chief John Okemos was uh, very well known throughout this area and up to Portland, Michigan. That was basically his um, seasonal travel route. Born between the years 1739 to 1775, he led the tribe until his death in 1858. The Native Americans of the area would plant cornfields in the flood plains along the Red Cedar, located on the land which is now Ferguson Park, Wonk Park, and Okemos Middle School. Chief Okemos became well known in the surrounding community, building close ties with various families, including the Turners. There's a lot of stories about his interaction with the children of settlers. Um, one story uh, of uh, a young man who uh, had a, uh, I think it was a bow and arrow, and Okemos was there, the, they, the, and so was the kid's father. Anyway, the uh, kid had a penny, and so dad said, well, I'll tell you, what, you know, to Okemos, if you can hit that penny with bow and arrow from, you know, where we determine, you get the penny. And so the kid's like, okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and give it, that, give it that a try. Anyway, I guess Dad put the penny a fair distance away, feeling you know, it's going to be safe. First shot, Okemos hit it. But again, again, a story involving, you know, a, a kid. He was a proud man, easily offended. But he was friendly and highly respected in the Okemos area. Stories about his skirmishes with white soldiers and other Native American tribes were shared openly by Chief Okemos. The fact he had taken his fair share of scalps was far from a secret. However, his connection with the community of the village of Okemos was obvious. But anyway, there, there's a lot of stories of that kind of interaction. So I guess, you know, and if you, I guess if there's any way to endear yourself to a community, it would be by befriending and being kind to their children. After Okemos died and was buried in Portland, the people of Hamilton, as it was known at that time, petitioned for the name of the village to be changed to honor the great chief. In 1859, the village officially became known as Okemos. As time went on, the area grew. John and Minnie Grettenberger, descendants of John Grettenberger, moved from farming to a new industry. They opened up a general store, the original building still located in downtown Okemos today. In back of what is now the karate building there, there that was our drugstore, there was a long sloping uh, hill uh, that uh, we'd put the screen up at the bottom of the hill, and it was a big one, a big screen, and the uh, people with the cameras would uh, be at the top of the hill, and they would uh, show those movies, uh, and people would just come and sit in folding chairs or on the ground or lay on blankets. Uh, the movie theaters were, you know, several miles away, and uh, my father used to contract with a traveling company that came once a week, and it was a nice way to get people together, and it was good for our soda fountain business in the drugstore. And uh, it would get several hundred people each week to come here and enjoy uh, that kind of activity. Small town, but it was uh, a fun place to be. In 1844, the first school in Okemos was held in Daniel Cooper's shed. When the settlers first came here, any schooling was done at home. Um, until enough settlers came. It was taught by a young woman, and I think there were five or six uh, children. But then eventually, as the community grew, then they began to set up individual one-room schoolhouses. And those one-room schools held everything from um, the six-year-olds uh, six up to, you know, what would be called eighth grade now. But there was only one teacher, but everybody was expected to help each other. Children of all ages were taught together, the community of learning close-knit, and the pastimes of the youth different than today. I had uh, a number of good friends, even though we were a small school, we were very tight-knit. Churches also arose, religion a key aspect in the early life of the area. It's very hard to be a 19th century settler and uh, not have some faith to tide you by. It was a tough life. and. This is during the time before antibiotics, it was before um, immunization shots. Jessie Turner um, and her two sisters grew up in Okemos and were very involved. Jessie never got married, 
marriage, you know, you got married, you were expected to have children. You have children, you can die. You know, childbirth was dangerous. Every woman in the family had a black dress because deaths were so common. You had to have a faith, a belief, you had to have something that would help you continue to move forward. Um, very important in that period of time for people. Today, Okemos is still a growing community, but its connection to the past is evident. It has roots that go back to the early 1800s, from the families of March, Hamilton, and Gruttenberger to Chief John Okemos himself. Though much has changed and will continue to change in Okemos, one thing remains true. It is a village with a rich history. About three miles north of Okemos lies the village of Hazlitt. It was 1836 when the first white settler, Obed Marshall, came to the area and built a house. However, Native Americans had existed in Hazlitt long before that. Mounds persist in certain areas around Lake Lansing, which used to be known as Pine Lake, providing evidence for a civilization earlier than that of Chief Okemos's tribe. By the 1840s, 35 farms and a school made up the swampy area around Pine Lake. However, the place was still called by most of the early settlers a wild land. Well, here in Meridian Township, the Hassel area was actually the, the, the area that saw the first settlers. Um, when settlers come to an area and they want to pick the best uh, property to claim or to, or to purchase, um, they're going to go for the best water sources. And clearly, what is now Lake Lansing is the largest water source in the entire county, Ingham County, not just Meridian Township. Then in 1879, something happened. And there was a trolley. It was called an interurban trolley. And it came from the city of Lansing out to Lake Lansing, or Pine Lake, as it was known then. Um, it was put in largely because uh, the area drew a spiritualist camp. That same year, the Pine Lake Post Office was built, adding to the village. Suddenly, Pine Lake became a destination. Those who lived in the city of Lansing escaped to the lake in the hot summer months. Pine Lake began to draw people to swim in its waters, as well as to have fancy picnics and spend time camping on its shore. Its popularity grew. By 1881, Pine Lake had its own small steamboat, Bell Hazlitt. In the late 1890s, a men's social club built the Izzard Clubhouse in the center of Pine Lake. Well, Lake Lansing basically was the Hazlitt area. It was originally called Pine Lake. And um, it was a beautiful area. It had wonderful uh, trees all around it, um, trees that were really good for uh, building um, houses, you know, log structures. Um, and so it was kind of a magnet, and that was just the start. I mean, then after that, as uh, the township grew and more and more people um, became a little bit more um, wealthy and could afford to do some vacationing or relaxing in the summer, um, that really became a magnet for not just Meridian Township, but the whole uh, Greater Lansing area. Um, at uh, one point, Ransom Eli Olds, um, the founder of Oldsmobile, had his summer home um, on the shores of Lake Lansing. Now, the, the, lake was for, the lake was where the amusement was mostly. Some of them used to put ice, used to put a sail up and do ice sailing across the thing, you know, you, just with the wind blowing you from one end of the lake to the other. And uh, they'd put a sail up and just fly across there on, on ice boats, I guess they called them. And they had balloon ascensions. They had uh, a, a steamboat on the lake. They gave rides around the lake. There was even a building out in the middle of the lake at one time. The spiritualistic movement of the area, the Namoka Spiritualist Association, was led by James and Sarah Hazlitt. In the 1880s, they bought up land around Pine Lake, establishing it into a resort area mainly for spiritualists. It was to be called Hazlitt Park, in dedication to the Hazlitts, who were the main fuel behind the project. James Hazlitt, who was a, had a haberdashery store in Port Huron, bought the property to establish the camp. He, was, he and his family were spiritualists. 
and they met there every summer and they had uh, places to stay and places to camp and camp buildings. And Well, the spiritualist movement really believed that there was an ability to communicate between this realm and the afterlife. And so it was very comforting if you had lost a loved one to feel that they were still nearby. And for a lot of people, it brought closure um, to be told by a quote psychic or spiritualist, don't worry, you know, your son Johnny didn't suffer. Well, you know, that to a grieving mother, you know, was very um, important. With James Hazlitt's death in 1891, the spiritualist movement in the area died out. Seven years later, his wife Sarah would give the land to the Hazlitt Park Association. Over time, Pine Lake grew. An amusement park took root in Hazlitt Park, where the spiritualist camp had been. It was complete with a figure eight wooden roller coaster. It was a real, really big draw. Uh, the whole Lake Lansing area was, and we can't forget about Lake Lansing Amusement Park because that's really the thing that lasted the longest. The old um, pavilion that they used to use for lectures during the spiritualist time became the Dodgem Car building. It had um, an enormous uh, roller coaster. And in the 60s, when I went there for the safety patrol picnic, I was under strict orders from my mother, you will not get on that roller coaster. It was pretty dangerous. They had tilt-a-whirls and um, cars that spun around and around up in the air, and they'd actually spin you out over Hazlitt Road. They had a fantastic um, uh, merry-go-round. It was a big deal, and that was the primary um, employer for Hazlitt teenagers. On that last day of school, the bell would ring at three o'clock, and they immediately went uh, to the amusement park to apply for their summer jobs. It was, a, it was a huge part of their life. I can remember we adults liked to go out there and ride the Dodge cars. <laughs> that, was, that was a fun thing to do. It's just fun to drive around those little cars and bang into each other, I guess. <laughs> Have you ever ridden the Dodge cars? There were a number of places, including Lake Lansing, that was a real draw for those people who wanted some entertainment. And so that's why eventually the amusement park was developed. The Dells was built in 1924. In the 20s and 30s, it was one of the most popular ballrooms in Michigan. It was a real magnet. I mean, they drew large, big name people. And then there was the Dells over there, which is now a lot of condominiums, but before that it was a big building and underneath was the bathhouse where you could go in and change your, you know, into the bathing suit or whatever. And there was a nice beach along there. And then up above was the, the dance hall and they had some name bands come in there. They used it top and bottom. And now it's condominiums. I think everybody was kind of disappointed when it was sold for condominiums and the beach was gone. Hazlitt has seen much change from its early days. The Dells was hit hard by the depression the amusement park closed. It's merry-go-round sent to Cedar Point in Ohio. Tourism still thrives in Hazlitt during the summer, but one can tell much has happened. However, some of the old remains. For instance, the Hazlitt Women's Club was begun in 1905 and still persists to this day. Their purpose was to self-education and community involvement. And they, were, they wrote papers on different subjects. They gave plays, uh, they gave musicals, and um, uh, contributed to various uh, organizations and causes. Um, they built the first fl uh, flower gardens in Hazlitt. Education has also remained largely important in Hazlitt. In 1844, the first school building was built by George Matthews. Over time, the building and location of the school changed. In 1900, Hazlitt School was built on land donated by Sarah Hazlitt. Ten years later, a second story was added. By 1950, a new school had to be built. They had uh, residents that were strong, strong supporters of education and donated their property so that they could have their schools, not just um, 
a one-room primary education, but also a high school, uh, which then became the junior high school building after they found they needed a larger high school. So Hazlitt really has been very supportive of education for decades. They really um, commit to their students. The public has remained instrumental behind the education system in Hazlitt. Well, it, it, they had some really good administrators, really good uh, people on the school board who were able to find and, and attract good uh, people, good, good teachers and administrators. The community is interested in the schools and that's, that's what's so important. If you don't have the backing of the parents in, in schools and, and the community. There has been much change in Hazlitt. Life is different. Even Pine Lake's name was changed, now known as Lake Lansing. Buildings and shops are different. However, one thing remains the same. Hazlitt is a village with a past worth remembering. Okemos and Hazlitt both lie within the boundaries of what is now known as Meridian Charter Township. West of the Meridian Line, where its name came from, the township runs north until it reaches Bath Township. To the south, it is bordered by Aladdin Township. East is Williamstown Township. And west is East Lansing. Both the Red Cedar River and Lake Lansing fall within its borders. On February 16, 1842, the Township of Meridian, which had been organized by an act of legislature, was approved. That spring saw the first township meeting in the home of George Matthews. The township grew over time, but it didn't see much change until the late 1950s. From 1947 to 1957, the township zoning board ran the township. The area was growing rapidly. More and more people were moving into Okemos and Hazlitt. However, the zoning board, dubbed as a political hierarchy, had overstayed its welcome. In fact, it seemed to consistently do as little as possible for the community. In 1957, a planning commission was voted in, replacing the zoning board. Two years later, the first official funds for the planning of the township, $5,000 to be exact, was budgeted for the planning commission. They would go on to create a master plan to guide the future development in the area, which included a civic center and central park. Along with the master plan also came a zoning ordinance. However, since this was the first time the township would regulate developers and individual property owners into thinking about not just themselves, but community development, it was a big deal. After three long, continuous hearings, and with no resolution on the ordinance yet found, the Planning Commission decided to stay as long as they had to during the fourth meeting in order to at last make a decision. It was 4 a.m. in October of 1960 when the last individual left the meeting, allowing the Commission to finally move to submit the ordinance to the Township Board. A year before, in October 1959, the Township gained the word Charter in its title due to the potential of facing serious sewage control problems and the inability of the present form of government. The plain old township wouldn't cut it anymore. By becoming a charter township, the growing community would now have a government with additional powers, including increased flexibility in the organization's structure, greater tax authority, and protection of the township's boundaries against annexation. In 1974, a contest for a township logo was conducted by the township board. The first place winners, Steve Peltier and Julie Lindens, had their logos refined by a professional graphic artist. The line on the logo is a symbol of the meridian for which the township is named. Some say the cabin represents the home of the Marshalls, one of the earliest families to move to the area. In 1976, the logo was completed and it was sold as a decoration on white marble paperweights. Meridian Charter Township has continued to grow over the years. Its central building has moved from location to location. The first township hall, built in 1868, stood for 90 years. It was torn down in 1958, one of the Grettenbergers purchasing the site for possible commercial purposes. Eventually, the Township Hall came to the building it is located in today. Throughout the years, Meridian Charter Township has grown and changed, and as it continues to do so in the future, its vibrant past will always continue to follow it. <laughs>